The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. Second Chronicles 10 Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam the son of Nebat heard of it, for he was in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, Come to me again in three days. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men, who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, how do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be good to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, what do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? <laughs> and the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to the people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now... Whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king said, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered them harshly, and forsaking the counsel of the old men, King Rehoboam spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by God that the Lord might fulfill his word, which he spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, what portion have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Each of you to your tents, O Israel. Look now to your own house, David. So all Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Hadoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor. And the people of Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam quickly mounted his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Second Chronicles 11 When Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled the house of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 chosen warriors, to fight against Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah the man of God, Say to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up or fight against your relatives. Return every man to his home, for this thing is from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord, and returned, and did not go against Jeroboam. Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem, and he built cities for defense in Judah. He built Bethlehem, Edom, Tekoa, beth -zer, Soko, Adullam, Gath, Marisha, Ziph, Adaraim, Lachish, Azekah, Zorah, Ajalon, and Hebron, 
fortified cities that are in Judah and in Benjamin. He made the fortresses strong and put commanders in them and stores of food, oil, and wine. And he put shields and spears in all the cities and made them very strong. So he held Judah and Benjamin. And the priests and the Levites who were in all Israel presented themselves to him from all places where they lived. For the Levites left their common lands and their holdings and came to Judah and Jerusalem, because Jeroboam and his sons cast them out from serving as priests of the Lord. And he appointed his own priests for the high places and for the goat idols and for the calves that he had made. And those who had set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel came after them from all the tribes of Israel to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord the God of their fathers. They strengthened the kingdom of Judah, and for three years they made Rehoboam the son of Solomon secure, for they walked for three years in the way of David and Solomon. Rehoboam took as wife Mahalath the daughter of Jeremoth the son of David, and of Abihail the daughter of Eliab the son of Jesse. And she bore him sons, Jeish, Shemariah, and Zaham. After her he took Maacah the daughter of Absalom, who bore him Abijah, Adai, Ziza, and Shalomoth. Rehoboam loved Maacah the daughter of Absalom above all his wives and concubines. He took eighteen wives and sixty concubines, and fathered twenty-eight sons and sixty daughters. And Rehoboam appointed Abijah the son of Maacah as chief prince among his brothers, for he intended to make him king. And he dealt wisely and distributed some of his sons through all the districts of Judah and Benjamin, in all the fortified cities, and he gave them abundant provisions and procured wives for them. Second Chronicles 12 When the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen. And the people were without number who came with him from Egypt, Libyans, Succium, and Ethiopians. And he took the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah, who had gathered at Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said to them, Thus says the Lord, you abandoned me, so I have abandoned you to the hand of Shishak. Then the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is righteous! When the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. They have humbled themselves. I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be servants to him, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away the shields of gold that Solomon had made, and King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze and committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept the door of the king's house. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard came and carried them and brought them back to the guard room. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, so as not to make a complete destruction. Moreover, conditions were good in Judah. So King Rehoboam grew strong in Jerusalem and reigned. Rehoboam was forty-one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naamah the Ammonite. And he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Now the acts of Rehoboam, from first to last, are they not written in the chronicles of Shemaiah the prophet and of Iddo the seer? There were continual wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, and Abijah his son reigned in his place. The second letter of Peter. It's addressed to the same network of churches as Peter's first letter, and it's likely written from the same location in Rome. 
Peter's become aware of the fact that he's going to die soon, and the evidence that we have from early tradition was that Peter was executed by the Roman authorities during the reign of Emperor Nero. And so this letter acts as Peter's farewell speech. He begins by offering a final challenge that Jesus' followers must be people who never stop growing. And then this is followed by two final warnings about a growing number of corrupt teachers who are leading Christians in these church communities astray, first by their corrupt way of life and second by their distorted theology. Throughout the letter, Peter is countering accusations made by these teachers against himself and the other apostles. And Peter's goal is to restore confidence and order to these church communities. So Peter opens by reminding these churches that through Jesus, God has invited people to become a participant in his own divine nature. That is, to share in God's own eternal life and love, which is mind-blowing. And it requires a lifelong response. To receive this gift means a commitment to developing the same character traits that mark God's own divine nature. Peter lists here seven traits to strive for. And the final one encompasses and crowns all of the others, it's love, which according to Jesus means devoting oneself to the well-being of others no matter their response or the cost. To love, according to Peter, is to share in God's own life. Peter then states the letter's purpose. It's going to act as a memorial of his teaching that can be passed on to later generations because he's not going to be around to give it much longer in person. So before he dies, he wants to address these objections and accusations being made by the teachers who distort Jesus' teaching and that of the apostles. So Peter first addresses an accusation repeated by the skeptics present and future, namely that he and the apostles just made up all of this stuff about Jesus being risen from the dead and king of the world. Jesus isn't really going to come back one day. So Peter offers his eyewitness testimony of the powerful moment of Jesus' transformation on the mountain. Remember the story in Mark chapter 9. The apostles saw Jesus exalted as king, and his resurrection means that he's alive as king and will return to rescue our world one day. And so the future return of Jesus to bring God's kingdom, this will fulfill what all the ancient scriptures have been pointing to all along. The words of the Old Testament prophets They're not fabricated fantasies. Rather, through these human words of Scripture and through the human Jesus, God himself has spoken to us. Peter then moves on to address the threats raised by corrupt leaders in the church, and he focuses on more objections that they raise. So first, these teachers deny the idea of a final reckoning when God's going to hold all people accountable for their choices. And this denial is what conveniently allows the teachers to ignore Jesus' teaching about money and sex, because they're making tons of profit by teaching in the churches, not to mention the fact that they're sleeping around. But Peter reminds the readers that God can and will meet rebellion with his justice. He recalls three ancient examples when God did this. He first mentions the story about the sons of God in Genesis 6 as it was interpreted in a popular Jewish work of the time called First Enoch. First Enoch says the sons of God are rebellious angels who crossed the line and slept with women, earning God's judgment. Peter then brings up the story of the ancient flood and then the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In each case, there was a rebellion that led to divine judgment. But, Peter says, God was always faithful to deliver his people, and he uses the story of Lot to provide an example. Peter then connects these ancient stories to the teacher's corrupt way of life. They too are after money and sex, they despise God's authority, and they lead other people to think that God doesn't care about moral decisions. He says they teach a message of Christian freedom and use it as a license to do whatever they want. And this is why Peter's going to bring up Paul's letters later on in chapter 3. It appears that these teachers have distorted Paul's message of liberation in Christ. But that's not the kind of freedom Paul meant. And Peter makes clear that these teachers are not really free. In reality, they're slaves to their bodily impulses. And the fact that they're Christians makes it even more tragic because knowing Jesus' teaching makes them doubly accountable. They have become pitiful examples of the ancient proverb about a dog returning to its vomit and a washed pig going back to the mud. Peter then addresses the reasoning behind the teacher's denial of the final reckoning. They say generations of God's people keep coming and passing away without seeing the fulfillment of their hopes. Where is this promised return of Jesus? Peter responds by showing how short-sighted this objection is. Look around, 
he says, at this remarkable universe that we inhabit. The fact that we exist at all means that at some moment in the past, God's word intervened in a dramatic way to bring something out of nothing and to bring order out of chaos, and he can do so again. And so the real question is, why is God taking so long? But Peter reminds us that our human conception of time is extremely limited. The long expanses of time through which God works don't fit neatly into the framework of our very short lives. These long amounts of time are actually a sign of God's patience because each generation is offered the chance to recognize its own selfishness, to humble itself, and repent before God's generous grace. And God's grace will bring the story to a close on the day of the Lord. Here Peter draws upon the prophetic poetry of Isaiah and Zephaniah, who describe the day of God's justice as a consuming fire. Peter says, the heavens will pass away and the stoicheia will melt by fire. This is a Greek word that could refer to the elements, in which case it means the dissolution of the material universe, or more likely, it refers to heavenly bodies, in other words, the stars. That's what this word means in Isaiah chapter 34, where Peter is quoting from. And in that case, this line is a metaphor about the sky being peeled back, so to speak, before the God who sees all. And so this is why Peter says the day of the Lord will result in the earth and all its works being exposed. The ultimate purpose of God's consuming justice is not to scrap the material universe. Rather, it's to expose evil and injustice and remove it so that a new kind of heavens and earth can emerge, one that is permeated with righteousness, full of God's love and people who know and love God and love their neighbor as themselves. Peter concludes by saying this is the true Christian hope that Jesus and all the apostles have been announcing, including Paul, whose writings can be misunderstood if you rip them out of context, but all the apostles are on the same page. And so Peter ends his final address to the church. Now, the tone of 2 Peter, it feels really intense, but his passion comes from a firm conviction that God loves this world and he's determined to rescue it through Jesus. And so this means that God's love must confront and deal with the sin and injustice that ruins his beloved world. And in God's own time, he will do so, opening up a new future for humanity and for the universe itself. And so 2 Peter has a wide, expansive vision of hope for the whole world, and it challenges us to examine our everyday lives. That's what the second letter of Peter is all about. 2 Peter 2 Peter 1 Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, 
since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 2 but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness, than after knowing it, 
to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Second Peter 3 This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. The letter of Jude, or more accurately, Judah, according to the pronunciation of his name, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Judah was one of Jesus' four brothers who are named in the gospel accounts. None of the brothers followed Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but afterwards they saw him alive from the dead and then became his disciples. All these brothers of Jesus became leaders eventually in the first Jewish Christian communities, and Judah was known as a traveling teacher and missionary. And this gives us the background to understand the purpose of his letter. We don't know what specific church community he wrote to, but it was likely made up of mostly Messianic Jews. His writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, as well as other popular Jewish literature. Jude had become aware of a crisis facing this church, and so this helps us understand the letter's design. It begins with an opening charge, followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And then Judah closes by completing the charge about what this church is supposed to do. Judah begins by charging this church to contend for the true Christian faith. He says his plan was to write a longer work that explored our shared salvation through the Messiah. But that project, he says, got delayed when he heard the urgent news about this church, and so he fired off this very thoughtful but very short letter. Judah doesn't begin with how they're supposed to contend for the faith. Rather, he first goes into why. 
It's because of the corrupt teachers who have infiltrated this church. And it's not their teaching that he targets, but their way of life. Their moral compromise is what tells you they have bad theology. First of all, they've distorted God's grace as a license to sin. They think that they're forgiven and they have God's spirit, so now they can do whatever they want, especially when it comes to money and sex. And so Judah says they betray Jesus by rejecting his authority and his teachings. And Judah wants this church to know that the appearance of these teachers is no surprise. He transitions into a longer warning to stay away from them. He first offers two sets of three Old Testament examples. The first trio is about rebellious people who in the past received divine justice. So the Israelites who rebelled against God in the wilderness, they got what they wanted and they died out in the middle of nowhere. Then he brings up a story about angels who are imprisoned for rebellion until they face God's justice. He's referring to the interpretation of the story in Genesis 6 offered in the popular Jewish work called First Enoch, where the sons of God are interpreted to refer to angels who rebelled against God, then had sex with women and were judged accordingly. Judah links this story to his third example about the ruin of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, where violent men tried to have sex with angels. Both these stories are about rebellion against God's order that led to sexual immorality, and that's precisely what the corrupt teachers are guilty of. After this, Judah brings up a bonus example from a popular Jewish text called the Testament of Moses. Like Enoch, it was not part of the Old Testament scriptures, and it was a creative retelling of Moses' final days and words based on Deuteronomy. In the section that Judah quotes from, Moses has died, and there's a good angel, Michael, who is refuting the devil's accusations against Moses, but he decides to leave final judgment for God alone. Now, these stories might seem kind of odd to you, but for Jewish people who were raised on this literature, Judah's warnings make good sense. The behavior of these corrupt teachers has ancient roots, rebellion against God's authority, sexual immorality, rejecting God's messengers. And this connects to the second trio of examples. They're all about rebels who went on to corrupt other people. So Cain, he murdered his brother, but then he went on to build a city where violence reigned. Balaam, the sorcerer, he couldn't curse Israel, and so he lured them into idolatry and sexual corruption. And then Korah, the Levite, he led a rebellion against Moses that ended in disaster for others. Judah concludes the second trio with a barrage of Old Testament images to describe the teachers. They're like the selfish shepherds of Ezekiel, or like the clouds with no rain from Proverbs, or like the chaotic waves from Isaiah. Their self-absorption betrays their claim to follow Jesus. They create chaos wherever they go. Judah concludes his warning by quoting from two other warnings, one ancient and one recent. The first comes, again, from the popular book of First Enoch, which claimed to contain the visions of the ancient figure Enoch from the book of Genesis. Now, what's fascinating is Judah quotes from the opening chapter of Enoch, which is itself quoting about half a dozen Old Testament texts about the final day of the Lord's justice on human evil. Judah then matches Enoch's ancient warning with a more recent one from the apostles. Peter, John, Paul, they all predicted that corrupt teachers would arise and distort the good news about Jesus. And they themselves were echoing Jesus' early warning about the same thing. And so this church should need no more convincing. These teachers have to be dealt with. So Judah then moves into his closing charge. He picks up his opening line about contending for the faith, and he unpacks how to do so with a cool set of metaphors. He describes the community of Jesus as God's new temple. And so they are to build their lives on the foundation of the most holy faith, which refers to the core message of good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for our sins. On that foundation, the church is to build itself through a dedication to prayer, by devoting itself to the love of God through obedience. And the integrity of this building will be maintained by staying alert for the return of Jesus to bring his justice and his mercy. And in doing this, they will help each other stay faithful to Jesus. Judah then concludes by praising the God who will protect his people and keep them from falling too far from his grace. The short letter of Judah is powerful and puzzling for many modern readers who ask why he quotes from texts that aren't today considered part of the Hebrew Bible, like First Enoch or the Testament of Moses. 
It's important to remember that Jewish culture in this time was immersed in religious texts. Jesus, his family, all the early Jewish Christians grew up reading the Hebrew Bible along with many later books that were based on and inspired by the scriptures. And we know there were ancient debates about whether or not some of these later books should be viewed as scripture. But regardless, they're still important. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to speak an important message to God's people. And so we have many Jewish texts from this period. They're known today as the collections of the Apocrypha, also called the Deuterocanon, along with the Pseudepigrapha. These were all preserved and read in Jewish and Christian communities. They were treated with great respect. It doesn't mean they were originally designed as part of the Hebrew Bible, but they are part of the biblical tradition. And so Judah, Knowing his readers that they would value words from First Enoch, he used them to communicate his message, which is this. God's grace through Jesus demands a whole life response, not just intellectual assent. Notice that Judah doesn't criticize or focus on the teacher's theology, but their immoral way of life, which denies Jesus. And so Judah is here applying what Jesus first told his disciples. If you really love me, then you will obey my teachings. For Christians, how you live is the most reliable indicator of what you actually believe. And that's what the letter of Jude is all about. Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. 
save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. If you're watching us online, you can trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, right where you're at, right where you're sitting. The Bible, again, if you would just believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins and that he rose again the third day, God promises you that he will save your soul and adopt you as his child. And if you do that, we ask you to please email us uh, and let us know that you've done that. The email address is info, I-N-F-O, at exaltcc.com. That's I-N-F-O at exaltcc.com. Uh, let us know you've done that. We want to send you a Bible, help you in your next steps with uh, your relationship with the Lord. And if you have questions about this, you're like, I don't know about that, but I got some questions. Just please email us your questions. We'd love to answer those things uh, and, and help you understand the gospel better so that you too can trust in Christ as your Savior.